And so I'm going to talk about a couple things in this, in this first talk. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about fractionation. Uh, and, and that's really, in, in radiation oncologists, that's how we talk about schedules. How, how many treatments are we going to give and on what kind of a schedule? Do we treat five days a week over six weeks? Do we give every other day? Do we treat, uh, you know, once a week? I mean, th these are different fractionation schedules that are used by radiation oncologists. I want to talk about how fast uh, and how much radiation we're giving. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some things that are being discussed in post-operative radiation therapy, when we should be doing it, should we, should we be seeing these patients for salvage or adjuvant. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about androgen deprivation, uh, and in particular when we're using it in salvage, because there's a number of things that have come up um, in, in the radiation oncology community at the radiation oncology meetings that I'd like you all to be aware of. So this is old news. This, this is um, this is uh, RTOG uh, 0126, and this was one of many clinical trials that have been done over the past several decades looking at dose. And it showed, as every other trial has shown, when we give more dose for prostate cancer, we get better control rates. And, and uh, no, ma no matter whether you're using the Astro definition or the P uh, Phoenix definition, whatever, whatever you show for intermediate risk prostate cancer patients, these patients did better with higher radiation doses. And so, the way you give more radiation dose is you give more radiation treatments. And our basic radiobiologic principles, the things that we were all taught as residents and, and kind of took, took to heart, suggest that for prostate cancer, if, you, if what you want to do is reduce the risk of late toxicities, you really want to treat with 1.8 to 2 gray, 180 to 200 centigray as your daily dose. And so if you're going to give more dose, you're going to give more treatments. And that's what happened. And, and over the past several decades, the number of radiation treatments that a patient receives for prostate cancer has, has escalated from six, six and a half weeks, probably when many of you were in training, to you know, what is now often nine weeks. And so this is, you know, there's been some pushback. There's not everyone's been entirely happy with that. But what if our basic underlying assumption is wrong? And, and I'm not going to make radiobiologists of any of you, um, but we have this thing called the alpha-beta ratio, and it suggests that for different tissues, different dose schedules might make the most amount of sense. And, and what if our underlying premise, which is that the, that the uh, biology of prostate is, is different than, than what we thought, um, if that's the case, then we can get better or same cancer control with a, a different schedule. We might get fewer complications. We should be able to get certainly better convenience, better patient acceptance, and a lower cost. And so that is exactly what the promise is of hypofractionation. And one of the early trials that looked at this is a, a guy, Pat Kapalian, who uh, was at the time at Cleveland Clinic. And he did this purely retrospectively. It's, this is, this is really just hypothesis generating. And he said, well, what if we give 28 fractions to 2.5 gray per fraction for prostate cancer? And he published this data and updated it many times and showed that the toxicity was acceptable and the, uh, and the cancer control rate as measured by PSA was just as good as if we were doing conventional fractionation. And so people did what they should do. They did some randomized trials, and there's a couple of, there's three randomized trials I want to show you um, that work in this space. One is the RTOG 0415, and this is, this is a trial that, that was presented um, about three years ago at, at the ASTRO annual meeting. It was low-risk prostate cancer patients. They were stratified by uh, um, you know, a, a, the variety of things, PSA, Gleason score, and whether they were receiving IMRT or 3D conformal. It is a non-inferiority design trial, and that's important. They were randomized one-to-one. -one. They had 1,000 men. They followed them for a long time. And in fact, these trials are statistically inseparable. The, 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 the hypofractionated uh, schedule and the conventional fractionated schedule um, were indistinguishable. And in fact, the, the hypofractionated schedule was trending towards being a little bit better with a hazard ratio of about 0.85. Uh, but statistically, a non-inferiority trial, all we can say from this is these are just as good. 
Um, there's a, a big trial that was done, I, I think this was a Dutch trial, that looked at, um, they, they were trying to prove superiority. Um, and, and in fact, what they did was they came up with a schedule um, of, of higher dose per day, 3.4 gray, instead of the 2.5 that was used in the, um, in the RTOG. And that actually calculates out to have a, a higher biologic effect. But it's about the same number of treatments, 19 treatments, uh, versus conventional 39 treatments. It was a superiority design trial. They were trying to prove that this was better. Um, it's a little messy trial because they didn't, con you know, there's no conformality of, in terms of how the uh, uh, androgen deprivation was given. It was by individual choice. Um, they followed a, a fair number of patients, again, five years. And once again, looking at, at conventional versus hypofractionated, the hypro trial showed um, a slight improvement to the hypofractionation with a hazard ratio of 0 0.86, but not did not meet the, the predetermined constraints for superiority. So this is a superiority trial that was a failure. It didn't show superiority. But in fact, the data, if you, if you look at it, it's a five-year relapse-free survival, conventional versus hypofractionation, 77 versus 80% is, is statistically uh, in, indistinguishable. Um, they did show that there was a slight increase in clinically relevant deterioration, which is the term that they used, uh, in terms of toxicities. Um, and, they, and in particular, the, the late GI toxicities were slightly higher, but you notice the delta is 2% different. That's, that was their threshold for uh, calling this a, 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 a clinically relevant deterioration. So, so there was a little more GI toxicity in the hypofractionated trial, but there was really no benefit in terms of overall survival per this trial setup. And the CHIP trial is the third trial. Um, this is this is one that uh, was multinational trial. And they did something kind of weird. They had three schedules of radiation, one that I would consider the conventional 37 times 2 gray, um, and two that were the hypofractionation, one that was 20 fractions and one that was 19 fractions. Now, you may ask, why would they do test thir you know, 20 versus 19? And I don't know the answer, but I suspect there was somebody on the committee who was just absolutely adamant that their preferred schedule be on this. So, so, so we ended up with those, with those three schedules. And I'll, I'll point out to you that there's a fair number of intermediate and high-risk patients that were in this trial. Same thing in the HYPRO trial that I just showed you. Fair number of intermediate and high-risk patients that, that were randomized uh, to hypofractionation. And again, a large number of patients. They followed them for uh, a fair amount of time. And the, and the curve at the top is the five-year biochemical or clinical freedom from uh, uh, failure, and, and you'll notice that, the, cr that the, s the curves are pretty well together, but there's one that just drops a little bit below, and in fact, that's the 19 fraction trial, uh, uh, 19 fraction arm that wasn't as good as the 20. And I think this is, this is kind of interesting, because number one, it shows that at, at this dose level, 20 fractions is better than 19, but it also addresses a question that patients always ask me and, and you know, non-radiation oncologists always ask me. It's like, well, is it okay if I skip that last treatment? And, and at least in this case, um, the answer is definitively no. Uh, these patients actually suffered because they, they uh, uh, didn't get that last dose. Um, when you look at the hazard ratios, it, it, you can, you can see on, the, on, 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 on this plot, significant, uh, everything is trending towards hypofractionation. Nothing that was statistically met the, the criteria that were predetermined, but it all trends towards. And when you look at the 57 gray, the 19 fractions, it doesn't work. But I do want to show you the toxicity profile, because this is kind of an interesting thing, it's an, and it, I like the way they showed it, it is visual. So this is the hypofractionation looking at GI toxicity, um, and this is the conventional fractionation. So what you can see is it has a little more in the way of acute GI toxicity, 
and it comes earlier. It's not really a surprise, but that, that, is, that is in fact what the data shows. But when you look at, um, and, and when you look at the GU toxicity, it does happen a little earlier, but it really didn't seem to be significantly different. Um, and when you look at the late toxicities, there was really no different uh, that was shown in, the, in this trial. So we've got a whole bunch of hypofractionation trials that have, that have all asked slightly different questions in slightly different ways, run their statistics slightly differently. But take them all together, and uh, there's, there's a, a, a year-old document now that you should be aware of. It's an ASTRO, ASCO, AUA guideline on hypofractionation. Um, and this is a guideline that I think you know, should inform our practice. And, it, and, and one of the key points, and I, I, didn't, I don't have the whole guideline up here, but one of, the, one of the key points is that hypofractionation should be offered to low-risk, intermediate, and node-negative high-risk patients with a high, a high uh, uh, level of agreement, high quality data, and a high consensus. So this, is, this has become part of my practice. But the other thing is that we have to counsel patients. There is a slight increase in, in particularly GI toxicity, um, that, and, and we don't know what the, some of the late toxicities are going to be. So this is the balance, and, and some people choose it, some people don't. I saw a paper at the Ranzer a couple of weeks ago um, that basically said this is a, uh, uh, something that a lot of patients don't want because of the toxicity. Um, well, if you can give it in 20 fractions, maybe you can give it in five fractions. That's stereotactic radiation. Um, lots of data that has come out for SBRT or SABR. Those are the exact same things. People have different preferred, preferred phrases. But, but the outcomes essentially are looking pretty good. Um, and, and RTOG has taken a look at this. They, had, they didn't do the trial I wanted them to do. They compared a five fraction versus a 12 fraction, but there was no difference in acute or late toxicity. And, and, and there's a lot of people who are adopting this five by 750, seven, seven and a quarter schedule. Toxicity is less. Um, I will point out there's some phase one, phase two trials in the node positive uh, space and something that uh, people should be aware it's out there. I don't think this is ready for prime time because um, there's a fair amount of toxicity because we're on a very steep part of that curve. I do want to talk a little bit about post-prostatectomy. We, we've got some data, uh, both from the uh, Getug and in, in particular from RTUG 9601, um, that I presented to this group in, in the past and said is, you know, essentially shows randomized data that two years of neoadjuvant uh, hormone therapy in the salvage setting makes a difference. Overall survival, freedom from progression, p prostate cancer, death, and metastatic rate. Um, I think this is an important trial for everyone to be aware of. At Astro, just a couple of weeks ago, there was uh, Dan Spratt had presented a secondary analysis of this trial. and and, and what they did was they stratified by PSA subgroups. This is less than 0.5 at the time of salvage. This is 0.5 to 1, 1 to 5, and greater than 5 at the time of salvage. Because most of these patients um, had, were, were in this trial that started in the 1990s. They were late salvage patients. Um, and in fact, if you look at the, at the, at the overall group and compare hor hormone versus nor hormone, um, there, was a, there was a significant difference favoring hormones. But if you just look at the group of patients who had a PSA that was in the 0.2 to 1.5 range at the time of salvage, the hormones didn't seem to make as big a difference and, and in fact, statistically, uh, was not beneficial. And when you look at the hazard ratios, um, and, and, and I, I'll urge you when this comes out in, in in, in an article form, take a look at it. Um, for that group that, was, that had a PSA that was, uh, um, that was in the lowest quartile, the, the under 0.5, under 0.6, um, patients were actually harmed by, uh, by, by the addition of neoadjuvant hormones. Um, it's, when they looked at all-cause mortality, a, lot of, a big increase in the all-cause mortality uh, in the patients who had, had the uh, um, the neoadjuvant hormone. So um, I, I would argue at this point, for the group of patients that have a PSA less than 0.6, I, I think that we should probably back off on the hormones. We're doing too much there. I think, I think even though the data is there in, in, in 9601, um, I think we're, we're pushing it on that subgroup. Um, 
And, and at the, at the uh, recent Ranzer trial, they presented an update on, on, uh, on, on this adjuvant versus early salvage radiotherapy trial, and I just want everyone to be aware of this as well, because now that we're seeing more patients, I mean, I'm, I've had patients sent to me with a, uh, an ultra-sensitive PSA that is showing failure after prostatectomy, and should we do radiation? And I think the answer, um, you know, from this, th these sorts of data is, no, we really shouldn't, that, that, that these patients are too early for, for adjuvant radiation and certainly should not be getting uh, hormonal therapies. So parting thoughts, I think we've got more data supporting shorter courses of radiation. Wherever you're practicing, you're probably going to start seeing that if you haven't already. We've got evolving data for SBRT. It's still not quite 100% there. Um, select patients may be appropriate for salvage rather than adjuvant post-prostatectomy. And the benefit of ADT in the salvage setting really depends on patient selection and, and should only be those patients who have a PSA of over 0.6, in my opinion.